family and friends. It's Thursday evening, so we're back at it. It's time for a Bible study. It's time for Bible study, and today, today we will uh, continue our Bible survey uh, as we navigate our way through the Old Testament, and we will be covering 1 Kings. 1 Kings. 1 Kings we will be covering today, and we're going to uh, go over the split of the kingdom, the split of the kingdom in 1 Kings. 1 Kings. I hope you all are keeping warm and keeping uh, uh, safe. Uh, I'm reminded of the psalmist that writes the words, oh, the weather outside is frightful, but this fire is so delightful. And it just seems timely since we've nowhere to go. Let it snow. <laughs> let it snow. Let it snow. I am being silly. And as you see, I am uh, trying to uh, make light of some things here, <laughs> but and also just trying to get into the festivities of this time of season. I'm actually a fan of the winter time. I like winter. I like the Christmas season. I like snow. Uh, snow often reminds me of home. Um, Chicago, hi everyone is at home in Chicago watching. So I thought I would... Um, just kind of get in the mood today. So you see, I got my silly uh, Bulls Santa's hat on today. Uh, so again, it's just trying to have some type of Christmas spirit. And again, uh, with this little this little dusting of what they would have called snow, what should have been snow. Uh, I am appreciative of it because I myself enjoy the winter time. So it is that time of season. So I pray that you all are staying warm. Um, not like it's really cold, but anywho, first King, first Kings on today. But before we jump into first Kings, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you. Lord, I thank you always uh, for Lord, for whatever reason you saw fit to keep us around. You've protected us in the night. You've kept us during the day. Lord, you provided a roof over our head. Lord, we're able, uh, our senses are working. We can feel the heat that's working that keeps us uh, protected from the cold. So Lord, we just give you thanks. We give you thanks in all situations. Lord, we thank you when times are good. Lord, we thank you when times would appear to be bad. For we know, Lord, that you are a perfect father, you are a provider, you are a protector. Lord, in any situation that we may find ourselves in, never took you by surprise. We know that there is a purpose for you allowing us or to go through some things. And Lord, even the things that we've caused and brought upon ourselves, Lord, you're faithful to us when we're not faithful to you and you still protect us and bring us out of those things. So Lord, for those reasons alone, we give you thanks, Lord. We give you thanks for the life of your son, Jesus Christ that uh, regardless of all of the decorations and all of the gift givings and all of the things that comes along with this season that we may celebrate here as humans on earth, Lord, let us not forget that and not just being a cliche that Jesus, your son, is the reason for the season. And Lord, that he came that we that he can that he for the purpose of him giving his life for us, that we may live forever and be with you. Lord, he came and gave us the gift of his life where he paid the price uh, for our sins, for our sins. So, Lord, that we may be reunited with you. So, Lord, this is the best gift that anyone could have ever received. And that was for a man, Jesus Christ, our Lord, your son, giving his life for us. Lord, let us for always, regardless, and we tend to it tends to get lost and everything that goes on around this time. But Lord, let us all give praise and give honor um, to you, to your son, Jesus Christ, for the gift of life that we only receive through him. So Father, I thank you and I bless you and I thank you for all of those who are watching, um, whether it's tonight or this week or as long as um, these videos are available. Lord, whoever watches, let them be blessed, not by my words, but by your word, which is life. Lord, your word gives us life and it gives us direction and it guides us. So Lord, we thank you for all of these things. 
And we bless you and we ask these things in the name of your son, Christ Jesus. This is our prayer. Amen. Amen. Today, again, we will be covering 1 Kings, 1 Kings, 1 Kings we will cover today. Now, just to get a running uh, start last week, we covered 2 Samuel and 2 Samuel, uh, uh, the theme um, covered David, the second king of Israel. So 2 Camp Samuel covered David's kingdom period or David's reign. And we discussed how chapters 1 through 10 covered David's triumphs, David's triumphs, his reign over Judah. And then 11... In 12, chapters 11 and 12, spoke about David's sins, say David's sin. Um, and then 13 through 20, chapters 13 through 20, talked about David's troubles, David's trouble. And then chapters 21 through 24 uh, covered David's last words. And the book of 2 Samuel covered about 40 years from 1010 BC till about 970 BC. So if you had not got a chance to see last week's videos or any of the other videos prior to that, please go back and watch them. Please go back to watch them. And also, if you're watching today, please click the like button and click the subscribe button. I had said a couple of months ago that I would, it was my wish uh, that we would have 100 subscribers before the end of the year. Now we're almost at the end of the year. And I think the last time I saw it, it was 90. But I know some of you are watching that have not subscribed. Please, please, please like this video. Please click subscribe. But more importantly, why don't you share it with someone else? Why don't you share it with someone else? Again, the best gift that we can give is the gift of life and we find life in God's word. So why don't you share this video to someone, um, to anyone, because we all need to hear God's word. So today we're in first Kings. We're in first Kings. Now remember during David's reign, during the kingdom period, uh, we were discussed that the United Kingdom period, the, the United Kingdom period, um, covered about 120 years. And that's when the kingdom of Israel was united under the reigns of three Kings. So we've already spoke about Saul, the first King of Israel, Last week, we spoke about David, the second king of Israel, and today we're going to discuss Solomon, David's son, who is the third king of Israel. And under these three uh, monarchs, if you will, the kingdom of Israel is united. The kingdom of Israel is united. But today we're going to see something different. We're going to see something different where today, because of Solomon's, David's son, because of his apostasy, because of Solomon's apostasy, the kingdom is actually going to be split. And, that's what, and then so this will catapult us into the rest of Israel's history where we have 10 tribes to the north that is known to or known as or referred to anyway as Israel. So the 10 tribes to the north uh, were uh, referred to as Israel after the kingdom split. And then the two tribes to the south, which was Benjamin and Judah, was known as the kingdom of Judah. And we're going to talk about that today. So prior to the split of the kingdom, uh, for the first 120 years of the kingdom period under the reigns of, of Saul, David, and Solomon each reigned for a total of 40 years. It was 120 years that the kingdom was united. But then we're going to see because of Solomon's apostasy, uh, God is ultimately going to split the kingdom and there will be two tribes to the north known as Judah. And then the 10 tribes to the, I mean, ten, two tribes to the south, which known as Judah. And then the two, the 10 tribes to the north, 10 to the north known as Israel, two to the south known as Judah. So let's hop in this here. So the first half of first king covers, the first half of first kings cover the reign of Solomon. And then the second half of first king is going to, kings is going to discuss the division of the kingdom, um, which takes us through about 852 B.C. The United Kingdom of Israel lasted about 120 years, as I, as I just discussed, and Saul reigned for 40 years. 
David reigned for 40 years and Solomon reigned for 40 years. Saul had no heart for God. Remember, uh, Saul just pretty much ran off and did what he wanted to do. He made uh, unauthorized sacrifice as if he was the priest. And then also God had given him instructions that he was to destroy the kings and the land and he did not do it. So Saul had no heart for God. But contrast to Saul, remember God tells uh, Solomon, I mean, tells uh, Samuel that I have, a, I've replaced Saul, I've rejected Saul, and I've chosen a man after my own heart. So Saul had no heart for God, but we see this comparison and contrast where David had a whole heart for God. Now, some of you are going to say, well, David sinned too. Yes, David sinned. But any person, uh, every person that God has ever called, with the exception of his son, Jesus Christ, every man and woman throughout the history of the world and the Bible have sinned. So this question about who has a heart for God and who does not have a heart for God had nothing to do with the issue of sin because from Adam we've all inherited a sinful nature. The difference was that David, whenever he found himself out of the will of God, David always, always, was willing to turn back, turn away from what he was doing and turn back or towards God. So David always desired to please God and versus Saul didn't. So we see that Saul, Saul had no heart for God, but David had a whole heart for God. Now, David's son, his successor, Solomon, had a divided heart, had a divided heart for God. So there were some things that Saul, remember, I mean, not Saul, but Sam, I mean, Solomon, um, who we know was called the wisest king. And God said that there would be another, never be another king or another man as wise as Solomon. But Solomon kept some ways of his father. Solomon kept some ways of his father. Solomon had a divided heart that resulted in a divided kingdom after his death. Solomon, David's successor, had a divided heart, therefore it resulted in a divided kingdom. It was because of Solomon that the kingdom of Israel was because of his apostasy, and we'll discuss this a little bit later, that the kingdom was divided because the king had a divided heart. Now the northern kingdom, known as Israel, as I already discussed here, Israel, the northern kingdom, lasted for about 200 years, and it fell to the Assyrian army in 722 B.C. So the kingdom was split in 931 B.C. The kingdom was split in 931 B.C., and Israel, the northern kingdom, so from this point on, when we refer to Israel, we're not um, I am not referring to Israel as a whole country. When I, from this point on, when I refer to Israel, I'm referring to the Northern Kingdom, to the Northern Kingdom. So, um, the kingdom was split in 933 BC. Israel, remember, Israel refer, referring to the Northern, as, to, as the Northern Kingdom, Israel lasted about 200 years, about 200 years, and then it fell to the Assyrian army. It fell, it fell to the Assyrian king in 722 BC. Now the southern kingdom, and from this point on, we're going to refer to the southern kingdom as Judah. So when I say Israel, I'm referring to the northern kingdom. When I say Judah, I'm referring to the southern kingdom. So the southern kingdom lasted almost 350 years. And it was destroyed by Babylon in 586 B.C. So if you see to my left here, I, up, at, up in the corner, I tried to make a little chart for you all and prayerfully you can see it. So what we have here is that Israel, the kingdom was split in 931 B.C. at the death of Solomon. The kingdom was split. Now, 10 tribes comprised of the 10 tribes of Israel that was in the north are we we're going to refer to as Israel and they lasted about 200 years from the time of the kingdom split and they were overtaken by the Assyrians in 722 BC. 
And now Judah, the southern kingdom, they lasted for about 350 years before they were taken over by the Babylonian army um, in 586 BC. Now, Solomon is one of the most amazing men who ever lived, and this is true. He is said to be the wisest man in human history. However, his downfall came as a result of the influence of his foreign wives and their false gods. And let's look at chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 1, verse 1 here. Uh, do I want to read all of that? Yeah, why don't we read uh, chapter 11, verse 1 through 8, and it should show up on your screen. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, um, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, uh, Sidon, and Hittite women. From the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, remember, Lord, the Lord God said this to them way back when he says to them and look what, how Solomon does different. He said, you shall not enter marriage with any of them, neither, neither shall they uh, with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. I'll read that to you again. God told the people of Israel and look what the wisest man ever in history does. It says, verse 1, that King Solomon loved many foreign women. Along with the daughter of Pharaoh, he loved the Moabite women, the Ammonite women, the Edomite women, the Sidon women, and the Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord has said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter marriage with them, neither shall they enter marriage with you, for surely they will turn your heart away after their God's. Wow, this is so important because oftentimes we even see with Adam and Eve and Genesis, it is consistent. Whenever the Lord God warned his people not to do something, he warned them not to do it. And he told them of the results of how it was going to turn out. And because the heart of man, the heart of us as human beings rejects God. And this is what true sin, this is what true sin is. We do it in spite of what he says. And it ultimately always turns out with negative results, which is so important and practical even for us today. Because today we like to rationalize and we like to reason out. We even dispute with God on why we think it is okay to do something or why we should be old, able to do something. Or here's the, here's the age old lie that we tell ourselves, hey, I could handle it. I know it happened to such and such, but it's not going to happen to me. Notice that the Lord God told the people of Israel way back when he did not say that it might happen. He did not say that it could happen. He did not say that, hey, you might be able to make it through this. Know what he says. Do not marry them and neither allow them to marry you. For when you do it, they will surely turn your heart away from me and turn your heart toward their gods. And it is a foolish, 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 foolish idea. And some of you are in situations now. I found myself in situations in life. There are some things that God never, I have to say this, I have to say this, there are some things that God never, ever, ever wanted you and I to experience. There are some things that you are currently going through. There's some things that I'm currently going through that are results of decisions that I've made long ago. There's things that we harbor in our heart. There are ideas that we hold in our minds. There's experience that has affected us negatively that the Lord God never wanted us to experience. And now today, even though it may be years past, a lot of us still carry some of those baggage, baggages from some of those experiences that we never were supposed to go through. Remember, Israel never would have had a King Solomon. Israel would have never had a King Solomon that would have caused the country to split. But remember, when we talked back in uh, 1 Samuel, the people came to Samuel and said, give us a king. 
so that we can be like the other nations so that he may rule and judge over us. And God warned them. God warned them that, hey, he told, Saul, he told Samuel, give them what they ask, but tell them, tell them that the king is going to do this. He's going to do this. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. He's going to do this and that and that and that. Samuel went and told the people and the people said, no, no, give us a king. So now we see the results of what is happening, even with Saul and even some of the things that David did. It brought calamity among the people. And now the leader Solomon, because of his choice, it actually split the kingdom. And because he married all of these foreign women and he turned, his heart was turned toward their gods, it caused the people to worship these other gods. Let's continue reading here. I'm still in chapter 11, verses 1 through 8, and picking up um, at verse at, at verse 2. No, we're still in verse 1. It says that you shall not enter marriage with them, neither shall they enter with you, for surely when you surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to those. Wait a minute, where, where am I at? So Solomon, yes, here we are, verse 2. Uh, Solomon clung to these. In love, he had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Solomon was a busy dude. Solomon was a busy dude. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon, let's pause right there. For David, Despite of everything that David did, despite of everything that David did, David never sought after other gods. David's heart was only uh, directed toward the Lord God of Israel. But Solomon, when he came, became old, he was not like his father. His heart went after the gods of his wives. For Solomon went after um, uh, 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 Astareth, the goddess of the Sidians, and after Milcom, the um, the abomination of the Ammonites. Verse six. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Don't that sound familiar? Sound like the book of Judges. Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David, his father, had done. Verse seven. Then Solomon built a high place for uh, Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of, Je of Jerusalem. And verse 8, and so he did for all the foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. Wow, the wisest man, the one who God said there will never be another man as wise as Solomon. In his later years, he began to, his heart turned and it was split to uh, worshiping the Lord God of Israel and the gods of his wives. And the Bible tells us that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. It is so important Ladies and gentlemen, the people of the Most High God, it is so important that we do not develop. Now, I, I, I am an advocate for individual thinking. I am an advocate for individual thinking with boundaries. Our individualism and having the ability to think and reason for ourselves does not give us license to think that our wisdom supersedes the wisdom of God. For God is all knowing. He's all seeing. There's nothing that takes him by surprise. The Lord God has the ability to see what the end result of a thing is before it happens. And when the Lord warns us of something, when the Lord warns us of something, it is so important that that we stop, that we listen, that we pay attention, and then that we are obedient to him. Because when we are disobedient, it is things like this. Now, you may say, Pastor G, we don't live in a time where we can marry 700 or have, have 700 wives. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. However, we do live in a time where we can unite ourselves with something or someone in some place that the end result it will, I don't care the strongest of you. Remember, Solomon, God said, it wasn't Solomon said about himself. God said that there will be another, there will never be another as wise as Solomon. But yet Solomon 
still was turned away from God. People, please hear me. There are things out there. I, I'll never forget my uncle taught me a lesson in life. He says for every person out there, and we were talking about fighting and thinking that you can beat up everybody. He said, remember, for every bad person on the street, and bad in the sense of like, this, this is a person that they, they got hands, that there's someone out there that's badder than you. There's someone out there that can beat you. For every champion, there's someone out there that can beat that particular champion. This is a better way to look at it. And when it comes to just life and living in this world, I know that you may think that you're superior over things, but trust me, trust me, trust me. There, are, there is someone out there that is badder than you. There is someone out there. There is something out there. There is a temptation out there that you left alone you can't beat. You can't be. And we have to be careful that we have to listen to the word of God. And when the Holy Spirit inside of us is warning, warning us not to go in a particular direction, not to do a particular thing with a particular person, not to settle here or not to settle there. We have to listen because there is something out there that you cannot beat. And you saying, well, I'll just call on Jesus is not going to help you in regard to, yes, we can repent. Yes, we can turn away. But there are some things out there that desires to overtake you. God tells Cain that sin crotches at your doorstep and it desires you. Uh, Jesus tells Peter that the devil desires to sift you as wheat. He's warning him to be careful. Likewise, the Lord warns us not to go certain places, not to hook up with certain people, not to make certain decisions because it will overtake you. And, and like we see King Solomon, and I know I spent a lot of time with that, that the wisest king, the wisest man that ever lived in the history of, of the world, uh, heart was turned away heart was turned away and we have to realize that sin itself sin itself sin the sin itself is apart from remember we have victory over sin in christ jesus apart from jesus it ruled you when we before we came to the lord i know you thought that you made your own decision no you were paul said that you were a slave i was a slave he was a slave that paul says that we were slaves to sin. And when we understand slavery in its fullest, that means that it had mastery over you. You did not control it. It controlled you. It controlled you. Let me back up off of that. The kingdom was divided. The kingdom was divided. There's a lesson here concerning the effect of our sin. There was a lesson here concerning the effect our sin can have on others. Remember the kingdom was split going back to where I haven't forgot where I, my place because they God warned them about the kings and what they would do. And Solomon's choice called the kingdom to be split. And the lesson here is that our sins can have effect on others. Solomon's sin of building high places to worship other gods perverted the Israelites, watch this, for the next 330 years. He and he alone was responsible for the, the apostasy of Israel for three centuries until Josiah purged the land of its idols. It would be another 300 years, 330 years, before another man would come and purge Israel from the idols that were set up all over the country. Now, you may say, well, Pastor G, I'm not a king. No, but some of you are husbands, some of you are wives, some of you are fathers, some of you are mothers, some of you are put in charge at your workplaces, some of you carry leadership responsibilities in your ministries, in your ministries. And this is what's important. This is the burden of being in leadership, that once you become in leadership, and even for those of you that are not in leadership, if we find ourselves, the, the choices that we make, sometimes just does not affect us it affects others and solomon's choice caused the whole nation 
to worship other gods for 330 years. Some of us, you and I, are living out choices that our parents and our grandparents or someone in our family made decisions about that is like, that, that is completely ruled through our family lineage. And we're like, we're recipients of it that we have to fight through and deal with some, with some things based off of choices that others have made before us. And some of us are still making choices. Oh my gosh, this is a preach. Some of us are still making choices that will affect the generations to come. And this is one thing that we can learn from this. Oh, passage, like, no, this is not just some make-believe, made-up story. This is not the Bible copying off of some other historic sto uh, 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 um, stories that was created. This is not just some fictional story. The Word of God is here for a reason. It's here for a reason. And it's warning us that we can't make decisions outside of God. Because even if we think that we're okay, because here's the thing, Solomon died. Solomon died. He did not experience the split of the kingdom. Solomon did not experience the worshiping of other gods. Solomon did not experience Israel being in captivity by the other nations. He never experienced it. He died. But the people that came behind him had to experience all of the calamity. And sometimes our choices, just because we do not see the immediate effects of our choices today, does not mean that it won't affect our children and our children's children and their children's children for the generations to come. I hope that is sinking in with someone who's listening today, because that's the immediate thing that we can learn from this lesson. Now, the division of the kingdom or the secession of the ten tribes was of God. The division of the kingdom and the secession, excuse me, of the ten tribes was of God. This is where we have to, this is key, this is key, and I'm going to cover these few verses real quick. It was of God, it was not of the devil. We are so quick, we are so quick to give the devil credit for things. Well, there are some things as of then, and there are some things as of now, that God has allowed us to go through. Some of it is God's actual judgment upon us here because of decisions that we made. And we often always want to shift the responsibility. It's easier for us to say that the devil made me do it or that this is of the devil, that these bad things are happening. Where sometimes things that we experience on the earth today, and I'm not necessarily pointing out one thing over another, but some things that we, you and I, even today experience here on earth is a direct result of God's judgment upon a decision that we made it was the lord it was the lord who um had sanctioned this split of the kingdom for solomon's apostasy was to be a lesson to judah it appears in chapters 12 as if the reason for the division of the kingdom was heavy taxation but the real reasons was solomon's apostasy it appears and reading the text in chapter 12 that the reason the kingdom was split was because of the heavy taxation of the king, but the real reason was Solomon's apostasy. And remember, apostasy just means to turn away from the Lord. In order to keep the two kingdoms separate, Jeroboam, Jeroboam, I can't speak to her today, Jeroboam, founder of the northern kingdom, adopted calf worship. Adopted calf worship, the religion of Egypt, and the official religion of his newly formed kingdom. And we see that in chapters 12, verses 25 through 53, where Jeroboam um, introduced Israel to calf worship, which was the religion of the Egyptians. And it removed, the calf worship was not removed from the northern kingdom until the fall of the kingdom. The religion was known as the sin of Jeroboam. Yeah, now I finally pronounce his name right. It's Jeroboam. Throughout the history of Israel, he made two golden calves and put one in Bethel in the south and the other in Dan in the north. He told the people that these were the gods that brought them out of Egypt. Wow, this guy goes way back to the Exodus and he tells the people of Israel that these two gods 
the calves, the golden calves were the gods that delivered them out of Egypt. He made houses for these gods and made priests of the lowest of the people who would serve this new religion. In addition, he made his own feast days. In effect, he created a satanic duplication of the worship of Jehovah. Wow, the new king, the new king now introduced the people of Israel to calf worship and he created a whole new religion. Wow, we have to be careful. We have to be careful because this generation also did not know. They, were, they, they, they did not know the generation before. And it's see how easy they were persuaded where leadership came in, new leadership came in and persuaded them to believe something opposite of what they had been taught. And likewise, today, if you and I do not know what the Lord God said, it is easy for us to be manipulated. It is easy for us to be persuaded. It is easy for us to carry out and do things that is against God's word. This effect created a satanic duplication. It created a satanic duplication of the real worship of Jehovah. So many times we see things today, and I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to say this and move on. We see things that are a duplication of what true worship to the Lord God should be. Baal worship was introduced by Jezebel in the northern kingdom. Baal worship was introduced by Jezebel in the northern kingdom and prevailed about 30 years until it was exterminated by Elijah, Elisha, or Elisha, and Jehu. Every one of the 19 kings. Now, if you see on my chart over here that there were 19 kings of the northern kingdom that followed worship of the golden calf. The northern kingdom, remember Israel, the northern kingdom had 19 kings, had 19 kings, and every single last one of them were bad or evil in the sight of God. All 19 kings in Israel uh, was considered evil in the sight of God for they worshiped Baal. They worshiped Baal, which was introduced by uh, Jezebel. Every one of the 19 kings of the northern kingdom followed the worship of the golden calf. Some of them also served Baal, but not one ever attempted to bring God back to the people or bring the people back to God, if you will. Out of all the 19 kings in Israel, in the northern kingdom, all of them worship the golden calf and some of them worship Baal, but not a single one ever tried to bring or turn the heart of the people back to God. Wow. Wow. How many leaders today are after other things and outside of the will of God and are not trying to lead the people back to God? If you are somewhere and again, it's no shade against anyone. And the center focus is not turning the people toward God, but causing the people to seek after their own desires. Remember, the book of Judges, everyone did what was right in their own eyes, but it was evil in the sight of the Lord. If you are under leadership anywhere that is not, the main focus is to not to turn and keep the people focus on God. Get out. Get out. The author, unknown. Unknown. The Talmud and tradition says that Kings was written by the prophet Jeremiah. The date of first king covers a period of about 120 years. Remember, from 972 B.C. until 852 B.C., from 972 to 852 B.C. The theme of this book is Solomon and the split kingdom. Our key verses today, our key verses can be found in chapter 11, verses 31 through 33. And I'm going to read them for your hearing. Chapter 11, chapter 11 verse 31 through 33 and reads, and he said to Jeroboam, take for yourself 10 pieces. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and will give you 10 tribes. That is the verse I should have been reading earlier. That is the verse. I apologize. That is the verse I should have been reading earlier. My notes were incorrect and I'm wondering why am I reading this? So chapter 31 through 33 and the, and he said to Jeroboam, take for yourself 10 pieces for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I, this is God speaking, I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and will give you 10 tribes, but he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. 
because they have forsaken me and worship Asherah, the goddess of the Sidians, uh, and Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the Ammonites, and they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in, the, in my sight, and keeping my statuses and my rules as David his father did. God tells Jeroboam that it was I, meaning God, that is tearing the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon. But because of my promise to his father, David, I am going to keep a tribe. I'm going to keep a tribe. He says in verse 32, but he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of the Jeru of Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen, the city of I have chosen. So that's our key verses here that uh, the key verse here and the theme is King Solomon and the split of the kingdom, and the split of the kingdom. We just read uh, chapter 11, verse 31 through 33, which is the theme, and then we see the outline here that the first 11 chapters is covering the United Kingdom, and it's still under the reign of Solomon, and then chapters 12 through 22 covers the divided kingdom, which is under uh, the, 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 the divided kingdom once. So we had 10 tribes to the north known as Israel and then two tribes to the south that was known as Judah. Wow, that's all I have for you all today. That's all I have for you today. That's a mouthful all within itself. I pray, I pray that you read First Kings. I pray that you look over these notes. And man, it is so much, it is so much meat inside these texts that is still applicable, applicable for you and I today for the reasons is that we must learn to trust God. We must learn to listen to God. We must learn to be obedient to God because our decisions has consequences. And with those consequences, oftentimes, will affect others even when we don't see the immediate res uh, the immediate uh, 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 result of our choices but here's the one thing that we do see here uh, that's the gospel message in here that's the gospel message in we talked about the Davidic covenant last week where God made a promise to David that there will always be a seed on his throne and here's the beauty of God here's the story of redemption right here even though Solomon caused the kingdom to split, even though Solomon caused Israel for the next 330 years to turn away from God and worship other gods. Look what God does here. God, even though he splits the kingdom, but because God made a promise to David, this is where God's promises supersedes all of our actions. God made a promise to David that there will always be a seed on the throne. And we can go and look at the end of the story that we know that it's through Jesus that he's always on the throne. And it was him that was the savior. So through David's lineage, we have an earthly savior coming as Jesus Christ. And even though in spite of what Saul, Solomon did, here, right here in this verse, that even though God is going to rip the kingdom from Solomon, he's going to split the kingdom, even though the people are still worshiping other gods, God says that he's going to keep one tribe. He's going to keep one tribe and he's going to keep the city that he chosen um, because of his promise to David, because this here is the narrative. It is from here. It is from this tribe. It is in Jerusalem that we are going to meet our savior, Jesus Christ, in the days to come as far as it comes, goes to our reading. That's all I have for you all today. Before we go, before we go, I pray that this little Bible lesson is blessing you as it is blessing me. But before we go, I thank God for each and every single one of you and all that you all are doing to support this ministry, the Lighthouse on the Pike Church. And it is my prayer that you will continue. It is, it is my prayer that you will continue to sow into this ministry so that we can likewise get this gospel message out and do some of the other things that we're doing here in the community. With that being said, if this is your first time giving or if you would like to give to the Lighthouse on the Pike Church, you can do it by three ways. You can do it by three ways. First, you can mail in your givings to the Lighthouse on the Pike, the Lighthouse on the Pike, um, and our address is 5904 Marble Pike, District Heights, Maryland. That's again, that's the Lighthouse on the Pike, 5904 Marble Pike, and that's District Heights, Maryland. And then secondly, secondly, you can visit our website, and that address is the Lighthouse on the Pike. Dot org, the lighthouse on the pike dot org, and click the giving tab. Click the giving tab, and then lastly, but certainly not, certainly not least, the cash app is available. Our cash tag is cash tag lighthouse on the pike. Again, our cash tag is lighthouse on the 
pipe. And then one last announcement, if you're watching this tomorrow, Friday morning, tomorrow, Friday morning, right outside the front of our church, we will be giving away fresh produce again at 11 o'clock, at 11 o'clock, right outside of the front of the church. Just pull up, pop your trunk, open your door, and one of us will just, um, we will sit the box of uh, produce in your car. Man, the Lord has been blessing us over the last two weeks. We've given away 320 boxes of food, and we'll be able to do the same thing again this week, doing this week. And, if, and so again, thank you all for your support of the ministry. Share this video, like it, uh, subscribe, get this information out. Anybody that you know that, are, that needs some groceries, just some, just some assistance and groceries, we, we are, it is our pleasure to help you. 5904 Marble Pike, District Heights, Maryland, 11 o'clock. Just pull up in the Circle Drive right outside the church and we will love to assist you with that. That's all I have for you all today. It is my prayer that the Lord blesses you. Remember, next week, next week, next week is uh, Christmas Eve. We will not have Bible study. We will not have Bible study. But stay tuned to our social media, uh, the Lighthouse on the Pike Church on Facebook and Instagram, where I will uh, come on and just give a little Christmas message, just a little Christmas message, just a little Christmas message. Because remember, ultimately, we can have fun. We can enjoy one another. We can enjoy gifts. But we have to remember that Jesus is the reason for the season. That's all I have for you. It's my pleasure um, to be with you all today. I look forward, Lord willing, to see you all in the sanctuary across the hall on Sunday and also uh, not next week, but the following week right here uh, for a Bible study. That's all I have for you all. Grace and peace to you. Blessings. Blessings.